Welcome to the training video on course accessibility. In this video, we will bring student voices into the conversation about real life accessibility issues that may arise in classes and how future teachers might try to preempt or plan for them through policy or other tactics. These students voice important concerns about course structure and Blackboard and Google Drive as well as socioeconomic and cultural accessibility of learning materials. Let's listen in. How can future instructors make sure that learning experiences are accessible to their students? Well, I would say that, well, one thing that really stood out to me when taking your class was that you had everything like basically like in the index right next to everything in Blackboard when we click into the class. You just basically had the assignments, had the Zoom link already there. And right. um, I would like to follow up on the material portion. Now, as when I took your class, I like how you basically made it very accessible to access um, different topics that we did throughout the semester. So when it came down to the uh, final that we had, it, was, it wasn't listed by more so the week. It actually had a specific topic name to it. So it was easier to go find that and read up on it. And you also had all the information separated. I think that's something every single professor should do. So it makes it easier for the student to learn in the class. Yes, yeah, just how it was organized. It was pretty helpful, a lot more yeah. user friendly. I would say you basically set us up for success the way you had us plan out like our goals, everything had a folder, everything had a spot or place. So when we went and did the final, it wasn't like, oh my God, I'm sitting here like searching through all my essays, but everything was in order and categorized. So I was just like, oh yeah, let me just go back to week three or let me just go back to week four. And, or even from when we were taking our notes, there, everything was just so organized. Everything was just really easy for me to explain and for me to go back and reflect on what I wrote the first time compared to how I feel as we're taking the final. That's a great example, Allure, talking about just how to present information in Blackboard in a, mm -hmm. in a way that kind of brings everything together in one place. One of the simplest ways to make your course more accessible is to deliver course content in distinguishable sections. Ask yourself, how is my course structured? What is the 16 week outline of the semester? How can I create modules that reflect this outline? As stated by Alore and Ivan, witnessing the course structure makes it easier for students to understand where they've been, where they are, and where they're going in the course. We submitted assignments in Google Drive pre-populating folders, which allowed students to look back at assignment categories and for them to reference coursework in an accessible way. After commenting on the structure and delivery of the course, our conversation considered the accessibility of course content, especially as it relates to socioeconomic barriers to education. Let's listen in again. So I'm getting more of like, maybe like low income families uh, or people who are homeless having accessibility to different things. Things help you out for school so you can better your success. A lot of teachers require or professors require students to get these materials that they may use like once. Just things that you can help, you know, because school is already expensive. This is something, you know, cost thousands of dollars for me to, you know, get help and, you know, go to school, which is fine, but it's more on the, like, more on the brink of well, things that aren't necessary, things that aren't needed. You know, we have the internet nowadays. You can upload all the files up there. A lot of what you did, which a lot of uh, professors did, but, you know, you still have those professors who want their students to get these textbooks that cost like two, three hundred dollars yeah. for us to not be able to return them or for us not to be able to, you know, sell them. And then we're stuck with a textbook that we're never going to use again. So like just things like that, just the materials. Yeah. That's a great um, example. Follow, oh, Go okay. ahead, Alor. I was just going to say, I can follow up on what Jaquan is saying. Um, she made us pay for a discussion board, which is basically Blackboard, but it was just a different app because we could download it on our phone 
But I feel like I've taken plenty of tests and quizzes where it wasn't required for me to also pay out of pocket for other apps. And it was just kind of hard for me. I got all of those things late, like maybe two weeks late into like the semester starting because I had to pay all of my tuition. Like I paid all my tuition, which was like 3K the day before classes actually started. So then when she hit us with that that weekend, I was like, well, I'm just going to have to wait until I can get it because, I mean, there's no way that. And then it's just like, I really didn't want to pay because it wasn't like needed. Right. I mean, of course, it's 2021. So we, uh, the class, we did find it for free just on like one of those movie apps. But then we risk of getting like spams and viruses on our computer. You already had us pay for two apps. Now we have to basically pay to take our final one, well, not technically, because somebody found a free website, which helped everybody. But I was just like, how do you know people have access to Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, and those kinds of things? Right. It's really great examples of ways that a financial situation can actually negatively impact grades. While this class may not require a textbook that costs hundreds of dollars, Daquan and Allure mention important points about the accessibility of learning materials. We shouldn't presume students have immediate access to the learning materials we present them, especially if there's a price tag associated with them. Our favorite subscription protected content might not be the most accessible content to share with students. How can we meet students where they are, presenting them learning materials that are immediately accessible, especially in the first week? Open access content or materials that are available via the library website might be a good place to start, especially if you're interested in supplementing the required textbook of the course. The final portion of our conversation features the perspectives of an international student, John, who comments on presenting culturally accessible and appropriate content in the course. Also, he discusses the importance of helping all students understand the norms of class dynamics and accessing the instructor. Mine mostly hinges on the political and uh, cultural, just because I'm like an outsider. So there are things that I'm seeing that most of you won't be able to see. For example, one last class that I took this semester, uh, I really felt bad because I was like, um, the only African student, international student. And uh, for most part, these are just like assumptions, but they are now real things that are happening to me. So there's uh, the assumption that Africans use maybe like black magic or like, yeah, those kind of things. And then some of the questions that are in the exams are actually referring to that. So I'm like, why is this here? Like, I'm the only African student and uh, this is now here. Like, some Africans use African magic. Wow. So I'm like, maybe it's not referring to me, but, like, this psychology is too much for me. And then, you know, our classes, we are in a class, then we also have group me, then the other students are laughing. Like, did you see that juju part of it? Like, I'm an outsider already. Like, I can't even comment because I don't even know if I'll be laughing at myself. So... I don't know, in terms of the cultural bit of it, what are professors restrained from not saying as much as there's freedom of speech? How, how are professors able to be sensible? And also from students, what are students not supposed to just uh, say to professors, for example? These are things like there should be a code that is signed before the semester starts. I used to see like students just walking out or saying something to the professor. So that, according to me, was rude. But as, as more as I, I understood this environment, I realized like people have a right to leave when they're not good. But what if it's the other way around? Like the professor has the power and is saying something and you know, like this is not right. Even if it's not like a personal thing. Really good. You're bringing up a lot of really good points there, John. Uh, first of which in terms of um, not really demonstrating cultural competence can really lead to the alienation of certain cultures in class. Mm -hmm. But then secondly, because um, that's inaccessible, but secondly, mm -hmm. in terms of the cultural norms of how uh, students approach professors, because again, what you said was uh, it would be considered rude in some countries just to walk right up to the professor or just walk right out of the room, right? Mm -hmm. So perhaps having 
in a, co a conversation um, near the beginning of the semester that mm -hmm. kind of lays out some of the ground rules for how to access the professor in a way that's culturally appropriate. Mm -hmm. Just as we should not assume all students can afford the learning experiences we offer, likewise, we shouldn't assume that students understand how to reach out when they need help. I hope this video has helped you consider issues of educational accessibility from the student perspective as you plan your delivery of the English 110 and 101 course pairing. In terms of course structure, as well as socioeconomic and cultural differences in the classroom.